And what I would like to do in the remaining 10 minutes is just briefly run through the piezoelectricity. Piezoelectricity is a completely side chapter of this whole course. Um, the uh, piezoelectricity is an effect which relates the stress tensor or the deformation, the body deformation, to the generated electric field inside of a material. The electric field uh, is related to the polarization vector, which is uh, expressing the either permanent or induced electric uh, moment in material. This moment can be induced apart from the electric field. It can be induced also by mechanical loading if we have materials that exhibit this phenomenon. So that means that you apply a certain stress, a certain deformation to your body. You apply, really, you deform it. And as a consequence of that, you generate polarization. You generate these electric dipoles, which are characterized at a given position in the space uh, by a vector. So you have a relationship between the vector and a stress tensor. And this relationship, again, in the first approximation is linear. So the higher is the stress, the higher is the polarization. Uh, they are not necessarily in the same direction. So I can apply a stress in a certain direction uh, on, a certain uh, on a certain plane and generate the polarization in perpendicular uh, directions and so on. That means that, in general, the piezoelectric uh, constants, called piezoelectric moduli, are three index quantity. This effect is something that you all know from your, uh, well, I don't want to say uh, daily applications, but applications which uh, you have definitely all met. The lighter is based on a piezoelectric, uh, piezoelectric element inside, uh, where you simply deform this piezoelectric element, uh, generate an electric field, which results in a spark across uh, the gas outlet, and that ignites the flame. Um, similar principle acts also in the car engines, right? When you are uh, sparking, or when you're igniting the fuel inside of the engine, not in the new e-cars, but in the traditional fuel-based cars. Uh, I have been in past fighting a lot with requests from my, from my kids to get so-called blinking shoe. It's very fancy and it's a real trap on parents with small kids. But the nice physical background of this blinking shoe is that there are not any batteries inside. But instead of that, you have in the soil built in a small piezoelectric element. And again, as the kids are running, they are, are pressing the shoes. They generate a small uh, electric charges, which are then uh, used via the light emitting diodes, LEDs, and cause this uh, blinking effect. Maybe you have seen that also that uh, some kids, adults, teenagers have the scooters with these blinking wheels. It's the same principle. And I am not 100% sure where, but somewhere are also uh, applied these piezoelectric elements in pavements. And so as you are walking across a pedestrian zone, you're essentially compressing the, uh, the tiles on the street. And by that you are generating, it's, it's a very slight, uh, it's a very slight uh, deformation that you cause, but uh, strong enough to generate a small electric field. And by going that you're essentially generating an electric power for the street. And one last uh, 
one last uh, application of this for those of you who had the privilege to be at our department here before the corona hit us uh, you might know the courtyard that we have here including the barrier which is to stop the external cars from coming to our courtyard and this barrier is again uh, all connected with a built-in um, underground piezoelectric element so as soon as a heavy car comes on top of this element it actually generates an electric field which then gives a signal to the barrier to be opened when you are leaving the, um, the courtyard with the car. So piezoelectric effect is everywhere around us these days and uh, we now want to describe this physical phenomenon, this material property uh, with piezoelectric moduli. So what are I'm the sorry? properties? Yes? Um, the electric field is only then generated if there is a change in the stress or in the, in the compression. Or is it also with a continuous compression so we could power a whole city with placing a piezoelectric uh, element underneath a very heavy bridge or something like that? Right. Uh, so essentially, for uh, you, you generate the electric field or the intensity of the electric field, which is proportional to the polarization. But to have a current flow, which is what you are actually generating, you need a change of the electric field or at least a gradient of that, right? And so for okay. that you need for that you need that. So okay. if you constantly press it, yes, you generate the polarization, but then the polarization is constant there and you have no gradient, uh, which would be the driving force for the electric current to flow. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Uh, so how can we now measure these quantities, these moduli? Well, the easiest thing is that you try to deform a piezoelectric sample a sample which exhibits this effect um, and you measure the polarization right or the generated electric field uh, so obvious thing to do would be again to take a cube and to deform the cube along uh, one second and third direction and always monitor the polarization vector by this you would be actually uh, getting always the vector t uh, X, E, Y, P, Z for, for example, a given sigma X, X. So this would allow you to obtain the components of the piezoelectric tensor D, X, 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 D, X, sorry, D, Y, X, X, and D, Z, X, X. And then you can repeat the same thing for sigma Y, Y, and sigma Z, Z. Right, fair enough. Now, what about the other components? So eventually this object here has 27 components. And by doing this exercise, we'll be getting only nine of them. So what about the rest? Well, of course, you can then start applying, instead of this purely compressive or tensile stresses, you can start applying also uh, the shear stresses. Why not? The problem is that from the definition of the stress tensor, how, uh, what, what we actually some kind of agreed on from the fact that the stress tensor is symmetrical, we will not be able to distinguish between components DI12 and DI21. Again, because these two stress components are identical and all what we can measure is that we apply a certain stress tensor defined as uh, sigma, uh, sorry, certain shear stress sigma one two and uh, this will be always related to a sum of these two components so in order to resolve this uh, ambiguity we define also the piezoelectric tensor as symmetrical with respect to the exchange of the second two indices this is our definition this is the definition which is related to our requirement on the symmetry of the stress tensor. Right? So this is now the general symmetry of the piezoelectric uh, moduli that 
it is symmetrical upon exchange of the last two indices, not with respect to the first one, right? This is not the same thing. It's just the last two indices. All right, I skip this part. You can go through it again. It's a bit of matrix multiplication and juggling, the same arguments, the same kind of uh, line of thinking that we had before for the strain tensors. We didn't do that for the stress tensor to show that uh, this object with the 27 components uh, transforms as a stress. Uh, as, as a tensor, as a tensorial quantity. Now I want to introduce something which will be helpful for us or also in the elasticity and what will be, uh, what will be simplifying this uh, notification, uh, uh, notation. If you think actually about our object, D, I, J, K, it has 27 components, I said. So for each K or for each I, that's even better. For each I, we have a matrix three by three components, right? And then I can order these three matrices for I equals X, I equals Y, and I equals Z. So I can think about this object as a cube of numbers. Fair enough. But I can also take into account uh, the advantage of this symmetry. So if I now take so-called Voigt's notation, I simplify the stress sigma i j into a tensor sigma i in which I have components sigma x x, sigma y y, sigma z z, sigma yz, sigma y, uh, xz, and sigma xy, which are labeled then by indices sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, up to sigma 6. In this vector, in which I have transformed a 3 by 3 matrix to a 6 by 1 vector, I have the complete information, the same information as I have in this three by three matrix. By our requirement that this matrix should be symmetrical, we actually, in the three by three matrix representation, we overkill it, right? We overstore the information. We can use also just six numbers plus the information that this represents a symmetrical tensor. And the same thing then, if you now realize what we have for the uh, piezoelectric uh, moduli, where we say it's symmetrical with respect to the second class indices, why don't we represent those using the Foyt's notation just with numbers one to six? And so we would end up with uh, just two index piezoelectric object which is now a matrix three times six, D11 to D16, D31 uh, up to D36, right? And that's something that is easier to be represented. Of course, I can easily write on a piece of paper these uh, 18 numbers, this uh, matrix three by six, rather than to write the 27 numbers arranged in a three-dimensional cube, right? Three-dimensional matrix. Uh, the downside of this is that while we know how to transform the uh, stress tensor, the strain tensor, or how to transform the piezoelectric tensor with three indices, we do not know a priori how to transform this three by six matrix from one coordinate system to another coordinate system. So if I want to express it in a different coordinate system, the way to go is that you restore your real physical object, the tensor, which is a three-dimensional matrix here, 
you would transform that from one coordinate system to another one by this uh, three times multiplication of the transformation matrix, and then again represented by this three by six Foyt matrix. Uh, 